Hereby I open uh, this academic ceremony uh, in which uh, Joseph William Loudon will defend the academic thesis, the development of molecularly imprinted polymers for sensor and colorimetric assay applications. Uh, may I invite you to present a summary of your study and the conclusions of your thesis. Hi, esteemed program director. Thank you for the introduction. And I'd personally like to welcome all friends, family, colleagues, and highly esteemed opponents. So the title of my uh, thesis is the development of molecular imprinted polymers for sensor and colorimetric assays, as mentioned previously. And this was uh, targeted towards chemical sensors. So a little bit of background on chemical analysis. Um, so chemical analysis is hugely important in many sectors across the world, ranging from agriculture to pharmaceuticals to medicine. Um, this means that millions of chemical analyses are conducted worldwide per day. And the way that these are conducted conducted varies massively. So it goes from very complex methods, such as LCMS, NMR, mass spec, to very simple methods, such as the assay formats that you can see on the screen. The beauty of these assay formats is that they allow the specific recognition of a target analyte, whereas the more complex methods allow broad spectrum analysis. Um, the, the way that these uh, assay formats work is uh, based around natural receptors. So natural receptors are antibodies, for example. So evolution has had hundreds of years to develop these towards the binding of certain analytes, and therefore this is highly desirable. But the current way that we actually produce these is by uh, cultivating them from animals or using very complex uh, reactors in labs, which costs a lot of money. So finding alternatives to these natural receptors is ideal. So this is where our work comes in. So our work is placed around molecularly imprinted polymers, uh, which are synthetic, or if you prefer, man-made receptors. So essentially, the broad idea is that we uh, take a molecule, we form a polymer around this, and then we extract the molecule from the polymer that we formed, leaving um, complementary nanocavities in the material. This allows the material to rebound the molecule that we've imprinted into it. So this circumvents the issues with the uh, natural receptors and produces a synthetic receptor. So the research aims were to synthesize many of these MIPS from an array of small molecules, um, and then to integrate these into different sensing platforms, primarily focusing on sensitivity and selectivity of these platforms. And then we wanted to take these MIPS and actually develop our own platform, so something that hasn't really been done before, and hopefully try and make MIPS more accessible to the general public and make these sensors more usable. So to understand where to start, we had to take a little look at current literature. Um, we made a short list of a few methods that uh, currently utilize MIPS as the receptor elements, and we came up with this. So we have a quartz crystal microbalance, which looks at a change in mass. So when something binds to the surface of a MIPS, you see that change. Um, electrochemical readouts, where you see a uh, electrical change in the uh, sensory platform. So either the conductivity or resistivity changes. There's many optical methods that employ MIPS. So ranging from fluorescent sensors to direct color change. Uh, and also there's lots of thermal sensing uh, applications. So this looks at a uh, change in thermal resistivity at the surface. So out of all of these, we decided that the thermal sensing approach could be something that uh, is, is a good idea because uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, we've all got used to actually looking at our own body temperature. So temperature is something that everyone can hopefully understand. So um, the method that we actually chose was the heat transfer method. So essentially we take a copper block, we warm it to 37 degrees and we have a thermometer placed in there. So we know this temperature. Uh, we place the MIP uh, on top of this copper block and then a liquid solution on top. And as stuff binds to the MIP, it blocks the flow of heat from the copper block to the liquid. So you see the change in temperature. So the benefits of this method are it's cheap. You're looking at thermometers, a bit of copper, and liquid. It's simplistic. Everyone can understand uh, the idea of uh, temperature change, and it's fast. However, the primary shortfalls of this technology lay in the layer deposition. So how do you get that MIPS on the surface? So currently, a um, stamping approach is chosen. This is where you take the MIPS uh, particles and you force it into a adhesive layer, forming your receptor layer. And this proves to be very irreproducible and low in sensitivity. So we came up to it with a solution. We decided to actually surface graph the MIPS. By surface graft, 
I mean we covalently bond the MIP to the surface, removing the need for an adhesive layer. So by removing the need for the adhesive layer, we actually uh, facilitate smoother heat transfer through the materials from A to B. And hopefully we increase the homogeneity of the sample as well. So if we're forming chemical bonds all across the surface, we're actually having uh, more places for the MIP to form and it's less heterogeneous. So when we conducted this, conducted this in practice, um, our Graken approach, we had much better control as predicted over the uh, deposition of the mix. So on the screen above me, you can see um, the image. So there's a lot of green on there. The green shows the flat surface and there's very few bumps, which is the yellow. So you can see the morphology across the surface is pretty much the same. So the flatter it is, the more homogeneous it is in theory. Um, we found that this re research actually improved the limit of detection as predicted um, and also lowered the standard deviation between samples. So we found that the more samples that we prepared, the more similar they were compared to the sampling method. The only downside to this was we actually saw a reduced linear range. And this actually makes sense if you consider what you're seeing here. If it's flatter, there's less surface area, there's less binding capacity across the material. And that's why we see this reduction. And again, I'm showing you uh, an image that not necessarily everyone understands. So we may have um, actually achieved some of our goals that we set out to, to do, but we didn't achieve translating this to the average everyday person. So we felt it sensible to reevaluate what we saw on our list here. And maybe something more logical would actually be optical methods, color change. In the last year, we've learned color changes in very, very important. You see a red dash, you know you can't go to work, you see something clear you're still good to go to work and get money. So we're all happy. So how do we turn MIPS into something colorimetric? Um, we actually came up with a method calling substrate displacement colorimetry, where we take a blank MIP, a vacant MIP with the binding sites. We load a die onto this, so it can be a commercially available die. So that's very um, enticing. And then we actually find that the die can be displaced when you reintroduce the imprinted analyte. So you go from something colorless to something colored. Fantastic. So this is a great concept. But we needed a quick proof of principle. I say quick, it took a while. Um, so uh, we chose a class of compounds known as uh, diaryl phylamines. Um, in 2015, these were being bought and sold as legal highs at the time. But actually, these have um, developed into a branch of compounds known as new psychoactive substances. And the current methods of the time struggle to differentiate these compounds from more classical compounds and even compounds which weren't of interest, such as caffeine. So we actually developed MIPS for this using the approach that we previously described. We extracted the template for the 2MXP and then we loaded a die. So when we developed this assay, we wanted to um, look at a few of the factors that affect it, affect the uh, die displacement. So we looked at the incubation time. So as the time increases that you incubate, the more die gets displaced. We looked at the interaction between the dye molecule and the analyte molecule to the MIP to come up with some mathematical model to prove that when the analyte has a certain binding, it actually displaces the dye. And then we looked at the concentration dependency of the assay. So as you have increasing concentration of analyte, more dye gets displaced. But again, I'm hitting you with a lot of graphs and maybe we're not getting the actual um, aim in mind. So as they say, seeing is believing. So I have a little video here. So you can see the assay in action. So initially, I introduce um, a solution not containing the uh, the target analyte to the assay, and you see no color change. Whereas in a moment, I will actually um, force a solution through the um, filter with the uh, dye loaded MIPS, and you'll see a bright blue color change. So the dye gets displaced. Um, you can see that on top, I have images containing a blank caffeine, two MXP, paracetamol, aspirin, and sucrose. And you can see the because the assay is tailored towards 2MXP, you can see a slight blue hue to the 2MXP, whereas for the caffeine and the other compounds, there's no displacement. So fantastic, we create something that's actually class dependent and can detect selectively that compound. Whereas the image below shows other compounds of the same class, so structural analogs, if you will. Um, and you can see that the assay also can act as a broad range sensor. So we've managed to develop that something something that can be specific for the class, but also detect across the class, which is really good. So we thought, great, okay, we've got this, but maybe NPS isn't something that everyone has heard of before. So we took it to something a little bit more classical, something that's been around a little longer, something that everyone might have heard of. So we actually chose um, 
amphetamine. So amphetamine is a compound that has been highly abused across the world and came to prevalence probably a few years ago when Breaking Bad was around. Um, so everyone has some kind of uh, awareness. So it's a stimulant and it's highly abused actually by students as a study drug. Um, and current tests actually um, are struggling to identify this straight off the bat because it has an amine. Current presumptive tests just look for that amine, but plenty of compounds out there actually contain amine. So how do they know they're specifically analyzing this? So we thought it was a strong place to actually create an assay for. So again, we developed the assay. Um, we actually um, created a MIP and NIP version this time, the NIP being a non-imprinted. So this allowed us to confirm the mechanism of the action of the assay was actually what we thought it was. So the imprinting effect actually shows a greater displacement, whereas the non-imprinted polymer you see very little dye displacement, and it's probably a specifically bound dye just to the surface, which is great. But the primary takeaway of this was uh, analysis in biofluid. Um, so we conducted this assay in a lab using a uh, biofluid uh, mimic known as PBS, that's phosphate buffered saline, and we got some results. And then we took urine collected from um, an individual, and we uh, spiked it with amphetamine. And you can see that the results in urine mimic those in PBS. So this is fantastic. We've taken a sensor that we've designed in a lab, in a laboratory environment. We can actually prove it functions with a real life sample, which has been spiked. So again, we're expanding, expanding on the breadth that this sensor can actually perform. And it's no longer just a laboratory experiment, we're moving towards real world applications. Um, to truly understand the scope of this assay though, the, the potential impacts we decided to branch out even further. So uh, illicit compounds is all well and good, but what happens if we apply this to something a little bit more well-known, such as antibiotics? We're all familiar with antibiotics. You've probably taken them at some point in your life. So in particular, we looked at amoxicillin. So the detection of antibiotics is a uh, increasing concern because the more we use them, the more they leach into the environment and the more um, antibiotic resistant strains of bacteria become apparent. And this is terrible because if this gets out of hand uh, it affects healthcare and affects the environment because we have bacteria that we can no longer easily get rid of so infection rates so so developing an assay for this would be fantastic because we'd be able to monitor these environmental samples biofluids and animal products to make sure that we're keeping antibiotic contamination down so again we've developed the assay this time it happened to be yellow based off the dye that we used but the primary takeaway of this research actually lay in the development of the polymer. So we're using, uh, rather than using a bulk approach where you create a polymer monolith, which is just a solid block of polymer that we have to smash up, we decided to get a little bit more elegant. And we chose um, emulsion polymerization this time. So the images on the screen show little spheres. So by using an emulsion approach, we generate more homogeneous morphology. And if we're creating more homogeneous particles, in theory, we should increase the reliability of the sensor. And this uh, publication was aimed towards that and highlighted how different versions of polymerization, more controlled versions, could benefit the technology as well. So in summary, our, for the first paper, we uh, removed the need for adhesive uh, layers in NIP deposition, and therefore we increased the sensitivity of an already existing readout platform. And then later on with our displacement assays, we actually created a, a more cost-effective MIT-based colorimetric assay. Uh, we demonstrated that we could use this with multiple chemical architectures, therefore reducing analysis time and overall making it a step forward um, with actually presenting a valid method of chemical analysis with MIPS that hopefully everyone can potentially understand. Um, of course, I'm going to add some acknowledgements in here because research isn't a one person job. So these people are great. And also, if this tickles your fancy, there's a few more publications here that you can potentially look at, which tells you a little bit more about what we kind of do. So at this point, I'd like to thank you for your attention and I'll pass the floor back over to the highly esteemed director. Thank you. Thank you uh, for your presentation. Um, the opposition will now uh, continue and be opened by uh, Professor uh, Honing. P professor Honing is a professor of analytics and system imaging here at Maastricht University. He's also chair of the uh, assessment committee and uh, also secretary to today's degree committee. Please, Professor Honing. 
Thank you, Mr. Prorector. Uh, dear candidate, first of all, uh, congratulations with great work pushing the limits and, uh, and the boundaries in, in sensing technologies and trying to find a solution to selectivity, I would say. Uh, extremely important, and I think uh, it's not done yet. But okay, uh, before we go into the science in itself, I would like to have a philosophical discussion, especially on proposition number eight. So I would ask one of your paranymphs to read uh, uh, proposition number eight. Simpler forms of chemical analysis empower people. Thank you. Dear candidate, um, as you say in proposition number seven, um, if this is chemistry, uh, I think this sentence for me is a riddle. So I suppose you will give me some question, uh, more than one answer on what do you mean with this proposition number eight? And do you really want to empower people anyway? Highly esteemed opponent. Thank you for your comments and your question. So um, yeah, proposition seven to me is um, essentially saying that Chemistry has more than one right answer. You have a synthesis, you have an easy way of getting there, you have a more complex way of getting there. There's multiple routes to get to the same thing. Um, so um, what we've done is potentially one solution to solving a problem, but there might be many more out there. So what you're essentially trying to do is you're, you're trying to solve a riddle, which doesn't necessarily have an answer. But, but, but can, you, can you solve me the riddle of proposition number eight? Because eight, that's sorry, a riddle I form. Apologize. So simpler, sim forms. simpler form. Yeah. So what is a simple form? And, and why do you want to empower people anyway? Well, if you want to, in, we want to empower the people because we want them to be able to analyze their own body. If you have greater control. Do you over, think that's really a smart idea? Well, it depends on what form it does. Because obviously, if you're giving people the power to actually truly know what's going on inside their body or what's going on with a sample, then you potentially... Uh, your hand in them essentially the keys to the car, right? Mm. Which some people would say is a terrible thing. Some people could say it's a, a great thing. In my personal opinion, I think everyone has the right to actually uh, know about their body, know about samples, have this knowledge at their fingertips. But then maybe someone would say this is a bad thing because then with that knowledge, they can actually do terrible things or they can change outcomes to things yeah. they shouldn't truly understand. So it really depends on your point of view. And I guess but who I, you I, are. I, I would say the, the freedom to to know about your body, that's for sure, but to empower them to make decisions on data, that's a little bit different from that, would you not yes. agree? Yes, yes, I agree. But um, again, depends on the data set and depends okay. what data we're looking at. But um, let's have a long debate afterwards then. Yes, yeah? of course, yeah. Okay. Um, so uh, continue on the, on the science in itself. Um, and, and you were showing uh, the basis of a lot of sensing technologies uh, on color, on thermal uh, readouts. Actually, I missed one technology, and it's called uh, plasmon resonance, surface plasmon resonance. So uh, why was it not incorporated in this thesis? Well, um, it's not actually incorporated because, again, we wanted to, the main aim was to develop technologies that um, could be applicable to the everyday user. And we felt maybe that, that fell, uh, fell under the branch of more complex. Okay. So as a group, we specialize in technologies that um, are easy to use with a little bit of training, whereas with that one, it's a little bit more complex. There's more understanding required. So mm -hmm. we didn't necessarily overlook it. I mean, maybe it's not in there. So the we thesis. will find the PhD who is trying to make uh, also uh, SPR more simple, like you say in yeah. proposition number eight. Exactly. So that's maybe yes. Nice. OK. Uh, I would like to go to page number 18. Um, and actually, there you show a lot of monomers. And for some of these monomers, I, I would ask you, did you use a racemic mix, mixture or were they pure enantiomers? Because for sure, when you do the polymerization, you will get chirality in your polymers influencing the physics of your MIP. This is a great question. So the monomers we probably used were um, most definitely race mix. And when we, when we buy them, there's no um, stereochemistry specified. And you actually find that um, the development of an enantiomerically pure MIPs is an ongoing field at the moment. So they actually want to try and develop sensors specific to different 
enantiomers. Mm. But the way that we did it, um, we used the race pick mixture because also if you look at some of the compounds that we used in here, such as the 2MXP, there was no stereochemistry defined there. So yeah. we're just aiming to look at both kind of stereo isomers and also for the amphetamine as well. I believe that was brought up in one of the reviews that we had to do. We had reviewer comments back and they were asking us if it was specific towards one. Um, but because we've used these race mic monomers, it probably isn't. But there is ways of tailoring that. That's actually. for sure. Okay, thank you. Um, going to chapter number five, uh, you, you tested the selectivity of the uh, color, colorimetric uh, assay, mm -hmm. uh, and you said, well, I'm going to uh, check the selectivity for amphetamine, uh, and I will use naproxen and uh, even ibuprofen, and I looked, of course, to the structures, and they were completely off, so they have no chance of having the same selectivity to the same MIP, I would argue. And I would even argue that the Netherlands is known for the biggest producer of all kinds of amphetamines, so it's very easy to get a lot of analogs here in the Netherlands. So why did you not test all those analogs? I mean, it would have been easy to go to a street corner, I guess, um, but we didn't consider that. So the point of this uh, research was to actually prove that this is more, so it's a, it's a fast method, but current presumptive tests just look at the uh, chemical functionalities present. So yeah, I, I was wondering because uh, also in the, in, the, in the drawing you made about this MIP that you saw a lot, I, I, at least I found out that there's a lot of proton bridges. So it's not the Van der Waals interaction. And then when you look to ibuprofen and naproxen, which are acids, they are uh, even having an anthracene ring. So in terms of Van der Waals, so they will have completely other kinetics and even other binding efficiencies to this MIP. Yes, but you'll also find in literature that though we're targeting a specific functionality with our monomer, they actually interact with other functionalities as well. So you'll actually find a lot of research on MIPS that hasn't been conducted towards the binding of different molecules. Um, so a lot of this knowledge is lacking. So if you don't try to bind a molecule, then that information isn't there. So you, when you're testing these, you need to test a variety of different architectures just to see how they interact with your polymer. Okay. So it would actually be beneficial if people begun testing more molecules against their MIPS rather than just two which are of similar. That's, that's for sure, that's for yeah. sure. Okay, uh, thank you, for, uh, Mr. Prorector. Thank you, candidates, for the question. Answers. Okay, thank you, Professor uh, Honing. Uh, we will now move uh, online and um, go to uh, the next um, member of the opposition. That will be uh, Professor uh, Schoening. He's uh, also a member of the assessment committee and he's um, a full professor at the Fachhochschule Aachen and director of the Institute for Nano and Biotechnology. Please, Professor Schoening. Okay, can you hear me? Everything yes. fine? Okay. Yes. So, first of all, dear candidate, uh, thanks a lot for your very clear and well-structured presentation. I liked it very much. And for me, it was also very helpful to get some kind of summary of your thesis. Um, regarding the questions, uh, I would like to start with, let's say, soccer or football language, because you gave me some kind of through pass when I was reading your title. And in the title, you have been mentioning both essays and sensors. And can you give me a short explanation what, what is, yeah, what, what's the difference between essays and sensors, especially between bioassays and biosensors? Hi, esteemed opponent. Thank you for your comments and your question. Um, yeah, so the, uh, some would argue that the title of the thesis is maybe a little bit broad and a little bit all encompassing. Um, so we had to find common terms to try and link all these different papers together. So I feel like your comment is very, very valid. Um, and trying to find a delineation between sensors and colorimetric assays is a little bit of a gray area. Um, I feel maybe we could have made it purely towards the uh, colorimetric assay side of things. So focusing more on that and it would have been a clearer delineation, but I felt it was very, um, it was needed to have the other technologies in there just to see how um, they perform against these and show how things can get simpler potentially. Yeah, yeah. but what's the main difference? What's the main difference between a biosensor and a bioassay in terms of definition? A biosensor um, converts into a tangible signal, we could say. So you could monitor that 
on a screen, uh, whereas a bioassay, we're looking at something that you have to visually interpret potentially. So maybe the delineation lies there, but I'm sure there's people who could argue either way, and even if there is a delineation between the two. And what's about reversibility? Sorry? About reversibility. Um, to have a... Uh, yeah. To have a reversible signal. Yeah, well, um, yes, we do, yeah, because MIPS can bind and unbind targets. So that actually adds to the reproducibility of the sensors as well. So that um, if, you can, if you're thinking of biosensors and bio assays, assays tend to be one use, right? Because they're based on biological compounds, whereas we could actually create a reversible assay with our MIPS in theory. But the, the assays that we actually developed are dye-based. And therefore, you'd have to incubate with the dye again to actually get the assay format back into the place where it was. So our assay is not so much, but maybe in the future, we could find a way of actually doing that. OK. okay. Thank you. Uh, one more question. Um, at page 20, you referred on this QCM setup, quartz crystal microbalance. And, uh, and you also mentioned the Sauerbrei equation, but uh, honestly speaking, this Sauerbrei equation only works in the gas phase. Yeah, but for QCM devices, you have been mainly dealing in the liquid phase. That means that the, the Sauerbrei, Sauerbrei equation does not fully represent the, the equation behind what, what should be added in that case. Um, obviously, um, gases uh, are completely different to liquids. Um, I actually have no experience using QCM. I know of people who use it quite a lot. Um, if we want to add something to this equation, we probably have to take into the uh, consideration the uh, viscosity of the solution and the way uh, waves can travel through the solution. Uh, because obviously, if you're looking at a resonator, liquid resonates different to gases. So I assume by uh, factoring those into the equation, you'd actually be able to produce a much more sensitive or reliable measurement rather than just using the equation that's shown on the on the page. Okay, one more question in the in the beginning of your thesis, um, and this question directly goes uh, to the to the question of my uh, of the, of the first examiner of Professor Honning. You have been discussing different kind of transducer principles. Uh, he mentioned that you forgot SPR. I would even add, you mentioned uh, to forget the most commercialized type of biosensors, which is electrochemical biosensors. And if we talk about electrochemical biosensors, especially about glucose biosensing, then uh, they broadly cover the market. If we talk about electrochemical biosensors, and we should distinguish between voltammetric and amperometric biosensors. What, what's the difference? What's the difference between um, voltammetric and amperometric biosensors? Ampermetric, we're looking at current, and the other, we're looking at voltage, I believe. So um, we're actually working on some impedance sensors at the moment in the lab where we're, we're actually looking at the resistivity uh, across the MIPS and we're trying to develop assays towards that kind of thing. Um, we briefly mentioned the Clark electrode in here, which was the earliest form of the uh, glucose sensor. Um, but again, we didn't really investigate um, impedance in this piece of work because again, it's a little bit complex. The average day user won't necessarily understand it and it tends to be more expensive. So you need very expensive readout technologies to be great for you, because I think the, uh, the impedance device now lab costs 15,000 euros. And if we want to get this to the average day user, I mean, that's a pretty hefty cost for analysis. Mm -hmm. One very short final question uh, for the heat transfer method. You have been working with resistive temperature devices. Why not utilizing thermocouples? Yes, so we um, we do use the thermocouples. So the thermocouple is placed in the uh, the copper block and the, the liquid. So we are looking at um, thermal 
resistance. Um, we could, so at the moment we look at increasing thermal resistance. So we're looking at um, the binding of a template, a target analyte to the surface. Uh, I always wondered, could we do it in reverse possibly? So um, you see a decrease in thermal resistance. I think that would always be cool to look into, but I guess that is a little bit more technical because you'd have to find a way of decreasing the materials thermal resistance using binding events, unless you develop some kind of displacement assay where you have something bound, which is more thermally resistive, and then it gets released with your target and a light making it less resistive. So that is a potential future for uh, the HTM, I guess. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Shannon. Uh, we will now move to uh, the third member of uh, the committee. Uh, that will be Professor van der Zander. Professor van der Zander was a member of the assessment committee and he holds a full professorship at the University of Hasselt and he's director of the Institute for Materials Research. Thank you, Mr. President. First of all, Mr. Lauden, uh, my, also from my side, my congratulations uh, with the work that you present or have presented in a very clear way. And certainly uh, for the results that have been obtained in the sense that, yeah, there is really made a step forward in, uh, say, developing different type systems. Now, for my questions, I wanted to go to uh, chapter three. And first to start with, uh, I wanted to, to uh, look at a certain statement you, you made in the introduction over there that uh, MIPS actually offer a kind of recognition in materials like enzymes. Uh, and okay, MIPS have the, the certainly advantages in the sense of resistivity to temperature and all kinds of things. Uh, but concerning recognition, still there's a, a difference. Can you explain it a little bit? What, where they differ, still differ? Hi, Lee Steen, the poem. Thank you for your comments and your question. Yeah, of course. Um, so we make it out that uh, MIPS are much superior to enzymes in possibly some of the publications in here, where in reality they're probably similar. Um, so the main difference between enzymes, obviously, or natural receptors like antibodies and MIPS is that uh, nature has had millions of years to develop these. Mm -hmm. Whereas what we're doing is we're throwing a load of components together in a lab, we're letting it stir for a little bit and we're producing these polymers. So you can imagine that um, enzymes, which are made up of proteins, the folding structure, the quaternary structure can actually get much more selective than us trying to tailor make ratios between monomer and cross-linker mm -hmm. in, in the lab. And um, a lot of actually what we do, you'll see um, when we run a MIP and NIP, so non-imprinted, uh, you see there's actually still a lot of a specific binding remaining. So what we're producing in the lab is nowhere near perfect. Whereas if you look at enzymes, they don't tend to suffer such, um, I won't say, what's the word here? Um, they don't suffer such drawbacks, let's say, mm -hmm. because obviously the functionalities placed in enzymes have uh, bridges between them without functionality. Mm -hmm. And it's much, it's, it's a different kind of sensor. And though we say it's akin, in, in practice, it's actually a little bit further apart than we let you believe. Yeah. That's an easy way of describing it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that that, that uh, I also noticed in your your thesis said uh, that you made that clear also in the, the the really the beginning of your thesis that you are trying to find uh, methods and actually chapter three is about that finding methods to have more homogeneous uh, binding sites and so on. So uh, and that you try to to reach with this surface functionalization. Uh, where you add monomers on the surface, uh, aluminium oxide, I think. Uh, yes. And uh, doing a radical polymerization over there. Now, there uh, you have a figure, uh, that's uh, figure six, uh, page 104, in which a parameter, okay, that scales with uh, sensitivity, that was called A uh, in this analysis. And there you see that with the thickness, this parameter increases initially, and then goes down. And I, I was wondering where this is really coming from. Uh, could it be that by the, the thickness, that as the, the, the layer becomes thicker, that the diffusion into the MIP 
is, is uh, going down. Could that be an explanation? Or? Yes, that, I mean, that was one of our assumptions as well. So you can imagine as you're building this layer up, it actually becomes harder for molecules to permeate the material, actually diffuse into it to act as the receptor. So this is where the ideal um, thickness comes from. So it's mm. a point where you have uh, the best of all the characteristics, so the best diffusion rate, the best uh, binding across the surface. Um, mm. And as you can imagine, also, you have to look at the um, resistivity, the thermal resistivity of the layer as well. So you can imagine as this gets thicker, it gets actually harder for the heat to permeate from one side to the other uh, as well. So it's going to be a, uh, a cooking okay. part of lots of different interactions. And the, the, the simplified graph, as we see it there, probably uh, only tells a small fraction of the story. And you could actually investigate that a lot further. Uh, OK, another question uh, or series of questions was that the relating to the different components of the synthesis, then I'll go back to the introduction. Uh, and there you mentioned the, the properties of the porogene. Uh, uh, well, you stated, okay, it should not interact with the template molecule. Of course, it's also solvent. Uh, so, and um, light dissolves light. Yeah, so, so I was wondering, okay, I can understand that you would then, given the type of monomers that you use, would avoid uh, monomers where you have a hydrogen bridging uh, donate uh, hydrogen bridge donating interactions, uh, but systems or solvents that have hydrogen bridge accepting properties are they also to be avoided? Um, well, well, we aim for actually aprotic, so we avoid that anything that can give protons, but. Um, that's one way of minimizing interaction between your solvent. Um, but yeah, it's kind of impossible to avoid all these interactions because at the end of the day, it yeah. has to dissolve your molecule. Uh, um, so what we aim to do is we aim to minimize, is probably a better word, um, these interactions. Um, if you, I believe if you actually go through a computational approach, you actually find that um, sometimes the interaction with the porogen, the solvent, is actually a beneficial thing as well to uh, perform in these. So it, we make it out to be this, this big evil potentially mm. in here, but in reality, there's, it's probably another in between another gray area where sometimes it's beneficial and sometimes it goes against yeah. you. Because at a certain point you use a mixture of water, water and DMSO. Yeah. Um, and okay, then I was wondering, what is the provision? Yeah, yeah. So in this case, they both are. Um, so if you look into uh, literature, you'll find actually it's actually becoming more, um, more appealing to actually introduce a small amount of water into these systems when you're forming the polymers. So there's been a small studies conducted where they actually show by introducing that little amount of water actually increases the binding capabilities of the formed polymer. So um, we attempted to uh, do this in pure DMSO, um, but for emulsion, you need some kind of aqueous phase there. Obviously you have the other issue that water and DMSO are both miscible and that brings onto a different element. Um, but um, yeah, we, as I said, we make it out to be this, this bad yeah. thing, but in reality, it can actually help the process a little bit. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay, thank you, Professor Mozamba. Uh, then we will move on to the next uh, member of the uh, committee, that is uh, Professor Ingo Brand. He was also a member of the assessment committee and um, he's a full professor at uh, the RWTH Aachen and the director of the Institute of Materials and Electrical Engineering One. Okay, Please. so thank you. Uh, dear candidate, uh, I also have to say uh, I think this is a very good thesis and you, you uh, also uh, visualized uh, nicely a summary of it. So I enjoyed reading and I, I also see the development in the field of MIPS. Yeah? And I followed that field for quite long. Yeah? So MIPS came, molecular imprinted polymers came a long way and I'm especially interested in the readout technologies. In the beginning, there was impedance spectroscopy, then we had the heat transfer, then the QCM, like you showed. Now it's colorimetric assay. And if you would now freely choose, what's the method of choice for readout? Highly esteemed opponent, thank you for your comments and your question. That's a very, very tough question. Um, I think it would depend on my end use of the uh, sensory platform. So if I wanted to get a, a product out there fast towards what people can use, I'd go for the colorimetric assay because it's, it's cheap, it's mm. probably scalable because we use bulk polymerization. Um, and it's, I, I wouldn't describe it as dirty, but it's, 
it's a little bit heterogeneous, but as we've been shown over the last two years that people can develop sensors and get them out there, even if they're only 30% efficient to detect COVID, mm -hmm. right? So if I wanted to get a product out there, which allowed rapid analysis for everyone, I totally go for the, the uh, color metric assays that we developed. But if I wanted to be a little bit more careful, if I wanted to be more certain of my results, I would, hmm, I would probably actually go for electrochemical impedance. Because again, uh, what we have to look at is probably not so much the readout, it's the, the deposition of the MIPS as a receptor layer. So the, the greatest source of error mm -hmm. comes from that. So I feel it's actually possible to develop an impediometric method using MIPS without having to actually deposit them on the surface. Mm -hmm. um, whereas with obviously, if you use quartz crystal microbalance, you're looking for a change in mass, so you've got no choice. Mm -hmm. And a few of the other methods also rely on the deposition, such as the heat transfer method, you definitely need the MIPS at that boundary. Whereas if you think about it, you can actually engineer electrochemical impedance towards something a little bit different. Mm -hmm. That's all, I think you're very right. It depends on the application. And uh, in some applications, you need a yes and no answer. And in the other applications, you really need a concentration. Yeah? So, and this is what you, what you want to read. So uh, in terms of impedance spectroscopy, if we stay with that, yeah, so uh, we are also struggling a lot with side effects in such assays. So what kind of side effects would is, yeah, affect your assay? Um, well, I know one side effect, uh, well, one potential side effect. So um, we developed these tests towards drug analysis, mm -hmm. um, but what a lot of people don't think about is what else is the person taking other than drugs? So if they've taken ethanol, alcohol, delicious. Mm -hmm. um, if they've taken that and they're using the assay, the ethanol is actually going to dissolve the dye off the MIP as well, causing a false positive. Mm -hmm. um, as well as solvent um, considerations, again, you need to look at the, um, the kind of um, polymerization methods you, you choose. Mm -hmm. So what we do is bulk. So we're very heterogeneous. So at the moment, one one uh, assay could be say that you've got more target co um, present than than the other. So at the moment, um, the heterogeneity works against you as well. But then also you can probably factor in temperature mm -hmm. as well as with many things. So the higher the temperature, the more likely something is displaced because it's got more energy mm -hmm. and you could go on and on. So the only way to avoid these probably is fact to try and normalize the way your sample is introduced to your assay. Mm -hmm. And to do that in the real world, that's a pretty tricky task. It yeah, is. So I, I would say what, what we do is a brute force approach. You know, so we, we impl implement many sensors at the same time and we try to control also the side effects. You know, so, but uh, maybe that's a kind of an over engineering we do and the chemists would have a different approach. You know? Yeah, of course. I mean, well, you, you could take these and add, add extra measures, extra ways of sensing mm -hmm. as well. But yeah, you get to a point where you begin to over engineer your the sensor and it loses maybe the uh um the, the you, you lose the goal that you were mm. hoping to achieve so if you're trying to make a cheap sensor mm. as soon as you start adding more things into it your your price cost is going up but then again i mean is money more important or is sensitivity and actually mm. a, a definite answer more valuable i mean it's like again depends on the situation mm. and you we, we touched it uh, another topic we touched it uh, discussion already, so the comparison to natural receptors and, and the synthetic receptors, I think uh, in terms of yeah, one property, they are much better. Yeah? So of course cheaper, yeah? but also in terms of shelf life. Yeah? So they can rest forever and still, still being functional. So did you do some, some kind of estimates or some kind of uh, experiments towards this? Um, I know well, it's done in the group, but uh, also yeah. for these assays, these colorimetric assays, uh, are there kind of bleaching effect for the color or whatever? Yeah, Anything well, I, I, so the, the polymer itself is pretty stable. So we know plastics are around for very, very long times. Mm -hmm. um, it's highly cross-linked as well. So this adds to the shelf life. But our assays themselves, well, I guess it comes down to the question of what dye you're using. So if you're using things like azo dyes, where they have an unstable NN bond in there, double bonded, um, they suffer photo bleaching really bad. So if you leave a solution of say methyl orange on the side um, for a week, you come back, it's a lot less orange mm -hmm. than it was. Whereas if you choose, I don't know, a more stable dye, um, crystal violet, for example, that holds its color for a lot longer because it suffers less of the photo bleaching mm -hmm. effects. 
Um, so did we investigate this? No, but should we investigate? Probably if we're going to get a commercial product. Mm -hmm. But I think primarily at the moment, people like to argue that MIPS are better suited for these sensors because they are plastic. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the main driving points. But as I said in the, uh, the presentation, um, one of the main points behind using MIPS at the time, maybe a few years ago, was because they were having to harvest antibodies from animals, whereas this, these days that's not necessarily true. They can make these in the lab just as easy as we can make a MIP. So we have these big reactors and they can just build it. So maybe we need to start focusing on different positives of our technology than focusing on potentially like the shelf life, for example. But we also say that enzyme-based or antibody-based sensors don't last for a huge amount of time, but you can have a COVID test set on your, sh set on your shelf for two years and it still functions to a reasonable degree. So again, point of view, how hard do you want to sell it? Okay, good. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Ingeborg. Um, the opposition will now be continued by uh, Dr. Kalau. Dr. Kalau is uh, Assistant Professor uh, at the Faculty of Science and Engineering at Maastricht University. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Dear candidate, thank you for this thesis. Congratulations, first of all. You, it seems like you did a lot, also considering all the publications that did not make your thesis that are in the back. So since I want to take this in a completely different direction than my predecessors, I'm going to start with a completely random question. Um, do you know what homeopathy is? Highly esteemed opponent, yes. <laughs> okay, so then I'm sure you know the irony here concerning your thesis. Probably homeopathic and homeopathy is based on homeopathic dilutions in which solutions are diluted so much that there's no longer the active substance but the memory of its shape remains yes so i guess you're going to allude towards that we say we've got a colorimetric assay and it's hard to see the dye not at all that nope. was just a random question <laughs> i want to go to chapter three okay uh page 98 please um, so on this page you are looking at figure three and i'm looking at the effect side versus the concentration so figure 3b and this data is obviously is undeniable that the mip works there's no question about that it works very well very well done i was just more wondering about the model that you use to fit this data can you elaborate a little bit on that why you chose this one yeah so um we choose an allometric fit nine times out of ten uh, because the allometric fit actually represents the uh, the heterogeneity in the sample. So you want to see a also saturation effects. Whereas if you use an exponential, exponential doesn't quite describe it because exponential tends to go on forever. So that suggests that there's always going to be more binding, mm -hmm. whereas an allometric has a defined okay. endpoint. So if you think about it, once the MIP is saturated, it's saturated, you can't bind no more. Whereas if okay. we try to fit with the exponential, which you could also fit with, Potentially, you could go on forever and you could end up binding, I don't know, every molecule under the sun. Okay, I completely agree with that. But I was wondering more why you would choose an empirical model over a thermodynamically derived model. Oh, that's a good question. Um, what would be the benefit of having a thermodynamically derived model? I've got to be honest, I actually, uh, I've never considered it and therefore I don't know. Um, thermodynamic, <laughs> so thermodynamic, we're looking at a uh, temperature mission. So we're looking at the way it binds and comes up. Exactly. Whereas kinetic, you're just looking at how it binds to the surface and assuming it stays there. Yes, so basically the difference is in the model you use now, you describe the data and it describes it very well, but you can mainly on, only interpret between the data, interpolate between the data points. So with a thermodynamically derived model, you can usually say more about binding affinities, how it works, about the mechanism behind it and compare different MIPS to each other in a more precise way. Um, but, that may be something for the future. Yeah, that, I have that one mean, small that question about this figure also, looking at the um, R squared values that you have of it. They seem counterintuitive to me for the red and the black line. So the one for the red line in this case is higher than the one for the black line. And uh, can you explain me maybe why that is? So if you think about it, you've got, you've made this MIP, which is the red line in question. Mm -hmm. um, so you've got defined amounts of, uh, nano cavities there specific to your analyte. So you can actually um, predict, well, not predict, the, the binding is, um, is patterned. Mm -hmm. Whereas with the NIP, you're looking at non-specific binding. So non-specific binding for anyone who doesn't understand that term is um, random binding. So things 
bind randomly to the surface because there's no orientation to the uh, molecules there. So it makes sense that the MIP is got, has got a higher R squared value because um, it's more organized. There's more there's more defined features, whereas for the NIP, it's more randomly placed, and therefore the R squared is worse. Yes, I completely agree. However, when I'm look at, looking at the data points, so basically the R squared value is the data compared to the line you yep. fit through. And if you look at the red line, you see that almost all points deviate. And for the black line, you see that they almost all go right through the line that would should usually result in a higher accuracy. Yeah, so if we repeat this again, so this is um, an average of three. Um, again, we probably should probably should repeat this to get the, the fit better. So maybe the fit actually for this data isn't 100% correct. Um, but the way data is fit, it's an average of where these points meet. So sometimes you get the, the points where, in this case, a lot of them don't represent the, the fit. Um, whereas for the NIP, it's easier to fit because the NIP doesn't, doesn't really do much. So it's really easy to get that fit in there anyway. So you could potentially put anything in here and you'd be like, oh, it's fit. But in reality, is it true? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Very clear. So if you want to continue to page 104, again, same figure again. Um, so already came to the conclusion that um, the, case, the more thicker the layer becomes, the more um, resistance you get. And of course, um, at some point, the, the dosage gets lower. However, to me, it seems a little bit with what you did with the figures, at least, with treating the data, and also, again, with the model equation that you used, that you're trying to reinvent the wheel by comparing this and try finding the optimum layer thickness. And I believe that it would be a lot easier if you could measure the binding enthalpy, the absorption enthalpy, versus the fusion coefficients of the polymer. And with that way, you could find the actual thermodynamically um, real layer thickness. Yeah, that, about that. if we took the thermodynamic approach, that in hindsight is a very, very good idea. And I might have to steal that and do that in the lab and it's another paper. So. <laughs> well, it's never too late to start doing that. Exactly. Um, I have one more very short question and it's all the way in the end. And I think it's on page 222 where you say, Thus, a basic concept from the mechanism behind dye displacement was formulated. Can you very shortly explain what you meant by that? Uh, sorry, what was the statement? Page 222. Yeah. Thus, a basic concept of a mechanism behind dye displacement was formulated. Ah, yes. What is the concept? Um, well, the concept is that we assume that the dye molecule actually binds to the nano cavities that we generate. And then when the uh, target Analyte comes along, it has a better affinity towards that nano cavity and therefore forces the less native dye out and rebinds itself. So that's what we meant by the stipulated mechanism. So as I mentioned actually in the presentation, we try to investigate this in the amphetamine paper where we run both MIP and NIP to mm -hmm. see if the imprinting effect was actually anything to do with this. And we saw that for the MIP, we had greater dye displacement. So the uh, stipulated mechanism that we suggest here has potentially uh, is the driving force behind this, but again, we can't confirm, but maybe if we start running thermodynamic models, we might be able to actually prove it a little bit better. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Collar. And I forgot to, to man, uh, mention, she's also a member of the assessment committee. Um, the opposition will now be continued by Dr. Bernard. Um, she was also a member of the assessment committee and she uh, is an associate professor at the Aachen Street Institute for Biobased Materials, the Aachen State University, together with Aachen, of course. Thank you, dear pro-rector. Uh, thank you, dear candidate, for the very interesting thesis and for the clear presentation. I want to start with a general question. And in fact, during your presentation, you already mentioned when we see one line we can come to work, when we see two lines we cannot come to work. So how does a COVID self-test work? How does it, well, it depends which one you're taking. Um, well, uh, sorry, highly esteemed opponent. Thank you for your comment and your question. Um, so if you're taking the home test, the antigen-based one, so it's a lot like the lateral flow assay that I've got described in here. So you have a um, labeled molecule um, for your control, and also you have some uh, uh, 
antibodies in there with the label on that interact specifically with the target as it moves along the pad. Um, this will interact with a compound bound to the surface in stick. That's where you get your line. Then your control goes up until it does the same in the next uh, line as well. So it's uh, interacting with labeled versions of the antibodies essentially. Thank you. Um, your MIPS are based on metacrylic acid, so you have acidic MIPS. Is there an effect of the pH on the performance of the MIP? Uh, yes, I imagine there would be. So um, what you don't see is, so these are just published results where in reality, we do a lot more. So we actually optimize the pH. We tend to buffer the pH because we know pH has a huge effect on binding. So what you really need to look at is that you'll notice when we use the metacrylic acid, it's with a, a amine. So the more acidic it gets, the more likely the amine is ionized. So um, you can imagine that uh, methacrylic acid, the pH of this has a big effect on that binding. Um, and actually when we're in the lab, we tend to um, analyze the MIP at a range of pHs to figure out where it best works as I imagine multiple people do in the field. Um, we also attempt with uh, acrylamide basic as well. And we do the same with that. So overall, yeah, we, we know the, the pH affects the binding massively. And um, you should always tailor your assays to that, to the situation at hand. So the pKa of the molecule that you're trying to analyze tends to be the preferable because that's when it's either protonated or deprotonated. Um, your MIPS, they contain ester groups and you are removing the template by a mixture of acetic acid and methanol. How stable are the esterlings under those conditions? Yeah, uh, well, in this case, so I imagine you do actually get polymer degradation. So what we use EGDMA, which is an ester. Um, I'm not 100% certain if acetic acid is enough to actually degrade these bonds. So the way we do it is um, Soxlet extraction. So we place the sample above a, um, a round bottom of boiling solvent, goes up, it condenses, drops back down. So at this point, it's not as hot as it was prior. So it's probably roughly 50 degrees when it, um, when it distills. Um, so I think in this case, you could argue it could potentially hydrolyze these esters, but because you need quite harsh conditions to hydrolyze esters, so you tend to use hydrochloric acid, for example, and it tends to actually be in the round bottom with the solvent, um, that's more likely to hydrolyze it. Whereas in our case, uh, because it's in cooler conditions, then I think you get potentially mild degradation of the polymer, but, but nothing too detrimental. So it would actually be interesting if you could extract some of these templates in milder conditions and, it, um, and compare them maybe, maybe the same MIP composition, but extracted with different solvents and see if there's a degradation effect there. That would be a cool study. And did you maybe follow uh, gel content or something like that to see an effect? Um, we did not, no. Um, we, we could do, I guess. Yeah, um, it's it's something that we don't really consider that much because when we make these MIPS, we make um, with a bulk, it's, I mean, is it degrading when you hit it with a hammer? That's what you have to ask yourself. So, I mean, is a little bit of acid going to degrade it more than what you've already done? And you're looking at something that's pretty heterogeneous already. I imagine um, if you got used a more elegant method of polymerization, you'd want to be a little bit careful because you've got these pristine MIPS which haven't, had to go the brute force of you hitting it. So I imagine milder conditions might be more useful there. Um, but these things we don't really, we tend to skip over as many people do, sadly, and it would be interesting probably to read further into that. Then uh, you developed this uh, new method uh, for coloring tree. And my colleague, Professor Engelbrand, already uh, asked a question about that too. But how does this method compare in performance uh, to the HDM method? That's a pretty loaded question. Um, considering my boss, the inventor of it, sat here, I'll be nice. Um, <laughs> um, my personal point of view doesn't reflect badly on you, but um, I think the assay format is more, um, I take it better. That that's not per well, that is personal preference. That's my own opinion. It might not necessarily be true because if you think about it, you can 
a assay format is more it's more portable for one. Um, you can tailor it towards anything you want. You're not relying on layer deposition, which is a big source of uh, error in these kind of things. Um, but again, I think it depends on the scenario. Um, you could argue the HTM is better because it's more sensitive. You get a defined result out of it, and you actually manage to plot a nice graph. But again, not everyone understands graphs, so assays, everyone understands color change. My personal opinion, the assays are better. Then um, figure seven on page 105. Um, in fact, the MIP doesn't differentiate between MXP and Dialsanidine. So what changes would you propose in the MIP design to make the sensor more selective? Yeah, that's a tricky one. So diphenidine um, lacks the methoxy group, which is an oxygen with a, a carbon and two hydrogens attached, um, whereas uh, 2XP has this. Um, I think you'd actually probably have to go completely back to formula. So you'd have to reconsider the monomer you're using because the monomer we use in this is the methacrylic acid monomer, and that targets primarily the amine, I imagine. I know it probably also interacts with the oxygen because we've got lone pairs on there. Um, so you'd have to find some other way of actually imprinting this molecule. Joseph Loudon, the time of point is for determining your thesis has passed. Uh, the degree committee will now withdraw to discuss the quality of your thesis in your defense. I request that you and your company await the result of our deliberations and our return in this room.
Let me uh, reopen the session. Um, Joseph William Lawden, um, the degree committee here present has assessed the quality of your thesis and your defense. And in view of its positive verdict and taking into account your previous qualifications, the degree committee has decided to grant you the degree of doctor. Congratulations. <laughs> Professor Clay is authorized to confer upon you this academic distinction in accordance with Dutch University custom. I invite your supervisor to now take the floor. <laughs> Do you promise to work in accordance with the principles of scientific integrity at all times, to be careful and honest, transparent, independent, and responsible? I do. By the authority vested in us by law and in conformity with the decision of the committee here present, I hereby confer upon you, Joseph William Loudon, the degree of doctor, and grant you all rights attached by custom and law. As evidence of this, I now present you with the degree certificate signed by the director, the secretary, and the other members of the committee, and affixed with the official seal of the university. Take some photographs and uh, maybe if you stand up front. Congratulations, that's the first one. Before I hand the word to, uh, to Bart for the Laudatio, I'd like to take the opportunity that I still have the microphone first and, uh, and really congratulate you. You are my uh, 
I first Maastricht uh, a PhD student, so that's also for me an uh, important moment, an important milestone. You're a little bit unlucky, huh? because uh, three years and nine months ago, I became dean of the faculty. It had still a different name at that time, and, and that's about the time that you have been busy in the lab. So uh, uh, I've been a full-time administrator and uh, not being around that much as I, uh, I should be. So uh, I apologize for that, but I find that you really nicely started here uh, uh, the research subject in Maastricht and uh, the first one, the pioneer of the field. So uh, very many congratulations and very much thank you to set us all up. And with that, I hand the microphone to Bart. Dear Joe, or from now on, Dr. Joseph Loden. I can still vividly remember meeting you. Gaspar and I were at a camp conference in Manchester hosted by Malus, our favorite frenemy. In this extremely professional setting, you presented a poster to us. And that evening we attended the conference dinner and in a truly professional manner, we discussed the possibilities of you doing a PhD in our, at that time, non-existing research group. The only hurdle you had to take uh, was to give up your passion for computational chemistry and join the dark side, applied research. Nevertheless, sometimes it is impossible to resist this love for computational chemistry and surfaces as evidenced by your latest paper. Merely months after our first, let's say, informal job interview, you started your journey towards today. You were the first PhD student of the sensor engineering department. But luckily, you did not start alone. Together with Ben, who will defend on the 26th of January, and Renato, who will deliver his thesis to me on the 10th of December. <laughs> you formed the backbone of our research department. We all took a chance on each other and had to trust that it would all work out. You can still remember the time when space was not an issue at Camelot. You witnessed the group growing into what it is today, resulting in an office that was no longer, let's say, COVID proof. And within the framework of this rapid growth, you were challenged to find your way in the world of independent academic research. I can only say you succeeded in doing so. You've learned how to fight reviewers, convince editors, and at the same time, you managed to always be a team player that made sure that new members of the group felt welcome. For me, the central engineering department feels like a family. We fight, we bully, we love and help the people next to us. And you have been and still are an important part of that. The fact that you are back today by Rossio and Renato confirms this. Like in any good PhD project, you had to overcome with obstacles. You had to start in an empty lab of a non-existing group. You had to adapt to a rapidly expanding group, followed by a lockdown and eventually a long awaited move to Maastricht. But you did it. As your promoter, I can only say I'm proud of you. Enjoy this day. You deserve it. Congratulations. Thank you. Dear Dr. Lardon, um, on behalf of the Board of Deans, I congratulate you, congratulate you with the honor you have uh, received. I uh, also have a small present on behalf of the Board of Deans. It also contains a certificate, so don't. Thank you so much. Don't lose it. <laughs> um, and I would like to thank all the external members, especially of the uh, assessment committee and today's degree committee, uh, for being present here and taking the time to uh, to move to Maastricht uh, for so many of you uh, that helped. My congratulations to the family, and um, uh, I would now like to close the meeting. After uh, I close the meeting, uh, I would like to ask all the people to leave except for the close friends and family and then we'll make some photos after which you can rejoin of course um so thank you very much and congratulations again